welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. He's a marketing pro transitioning from specialty medicines to disrupt small businesses. He's a geofencing admin, transform industries, driving 5,000 monthly visits globally. Please welcome the co-founders of Caleri and Wardell, Barbara Wardell and Ernesto Caleri. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with a tag team duo of Barbara and Ernesto Really excited about this uh, because it's kind of talking about trafficking, about using marketing, and again, how we can get better as entrepreneurs in our own uh, growth. So, but before I get into all that, Ernesto, Barbara, love to introduce yourselves. Please give us a little background. Who is, first we'll go with Barbara. Who is Barbara? Who is Barbara? Well, I'm Barbara (laughs) Wardell, the the Wardell in the the group. Anyway, um, uh. I'm an entrepreneur. I've been around entrepreneuring uh, entrepreneurs for probably about my whole in- adult life. And um, between, you know, being married and having an entrepreneur husband and then, you know, raising my children on my own and then going on my own um, in my own business. But before, in between all that, I was uh, a, a specialty medicine rep. So that was just, uh, that was about a, almost a decade of my life. So imagine 2000 miles a month in your car into offices. <laughs> so then we started this and um, we've been excited and it's been a great ride so far. Ernesto? I'm Ernesto Caleri. I'm co-founder with Barbara of Caleri Wardell. We're an international geofencing ad agency and we specialize in using GPS data, location-based data, uh, smartphone data, to drive 5,000 satellite verified visits a month in a post-COVID world. So essentially, we use satellites to draw virtual fences around areas of interest, and then we divert those um, their eyeballs to your ad, and then we divert foot traffic to your location, and then when someone shows up, satellite pings us, alerting us that a new visit has taken place, and Calarian Wardell came about during COVID yes. um, because, you know, in New York and New Jersey, uh, a third of small businesses were being forced through those um, shutdowns, forced out of business. And, Barbara- and some we love so much and, and we wanted to figure out how to help them. So this is something that we came to figure out how to bring this technology to the small businesses. And it was a huge accomplishment because they didn't have this technology. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting, uh, the best way I can kind of articulate it to you, so for the folks listening is, is, is uh, when you're going on Snapchat and they have those filters that I think of the geofencing like that, for example, when I got married, I, 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 I sent in a thing to Snapchat. And so we had our own little filter for during our marriage. However, it was only within this little circle just a little circle around our, our wedding, our, our church. So basically, again, so like from a marketing perspective, folks, you don't really want to be marketing to a folk is a, your brick and mortar location, right? You're, you know, they're talking, Barbara and Ernesto are talking about bringing folks to your brick and mortar if they're in Bangladesh and you're in Portland, Oregon, right? They, I mean, that it might make true. sense, but it might not make <laughs> sense, right? No, you want to go in that three mile radius. And um, definitely um, we can do it, tr- drive traffic to websites as well, not just brick and mortar. Oh, tell me a little bit more of that. Why, why the three miles? Um, because that's basically your foot traffic. Your mobile foot traffic study is, is pretty much your business model. Unless you're doing like a pickup and delivery or something like that, that could be 15 miles depending on your business. But we've, we have brought the three mile, um, pinpoint because of the ad spend money as well. We want to make the best of that ad spend money. And the three mile radius seems to be that, that pinpoint. 
Interesting. Interesting. So that's, that's really good insight. Now, Ernesto, question for you. How, you know, again, thinking of the retail space here, how do you drive retail growth and conversion with the geofencing? So um, the most important part about how to make this work is Barbara and I will conduct a mobile foot traffic study. And um, say we own a, a clothing boutique store. And, you know, through the mobile traffic uh, study, we can tell that within a three to five mile radius, there these are all the stores that um, customers who would go to our particular boutique would go to um, on the way to a, a shop like ours. So whether our store is new or not, we can conduct uh, studies on nearby businesses to determine where a lookalike audience would be. So once we determine these targets, we're then able to send ads to these virtual fences. So if we know that there's shoppers in another boutique, if we know that you know there's a Mercedes-Benz dealership uh, or, or a Ford dealership or a Range Rover dealership, we, and we think that's our lookalike customer, we can capture all those devices, we can anonymize all the de those devices, and we can draw an inference like, hey, these people shop at a, for luxury products, they're most likely to come to my store if we also sell luxury products. And then we track the phone after they're, they're anonymized, and we could track them up to the point where they come to our location for which the satellite then sends us a okay. ping like, hey, here, you Ernesto and Barbara here. showed up. <laughs> that's, so, Barbara so it's, needs a new handbag. Yeah, it's like the, it's like the ring doorbell, right? When like you, when like Amazon kind of comes through. Dang, dang it! What the wife order again? Because I know they're <laughs> yes. here. I see the ring doorbell. There's a notification on my phone. Now I, I gotta ask. Let's take a step back. How the heck? Like you guys are talking about like satellites, right? And having to ask. Yes, the, how the heck yes. to do? Like like how do you start a geo fencing business? Like I, well, well, take us to the beginning of the startup. Like how did you start that? All right, you want to take it, Ernesto? Because he started it first. Oh, perfect. we have a mutual. Well, you started it first. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we have um, a mutual friend who had a problem, right? And this is the, the mother of all inventions. Man, come, every and very come, great entrepreneur us, starts. We solved with a problem. Solved a problem, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. His name's Charles Measley. He runs a uh, very successful laundromat business, and uh, but this this technology applies to anything where you need people to come to your to your shop or or to your office. So he's like, you know, COVID really has messed up dry cleaning. It's messed up the laundry industry, even though they're they're considered an essential business. Restaurants. Yeah. Uh, small boutiques. But he was like, if you can master this technology, because it's we they couldn't really find an agency to do it. And we were already doing marketing and advertising in a traditional sense. Um, he's like, if you can sort this out, if you can determine how to drive in-person visits, I'll refer everyone in my industry to you, which which he fulfilled that promise. So I took a deep dive. I did a full year immersion in all the technologies that were out there. Um, I determined, you know, so how do you get access to a satellite? That's our little secret. But um, it's it, it derived from a problem. And it's really it derived from COVID and a, another small business entrepreneur coming to us and saying, we need you to drive traffic to our doors. And geofencing is the only way to assure that people are actually showing up. It's the only way to see that you have an actual return on ad spend. Man, you know, that's, we, sorry, go for it, Barbara. Um, because we actually can see where they came from and where, where they went. And when they come into your store, we already know where they came from. Our reports are said that detailed. You know, it's it's interesting because I think that's something we've been talking about pretty consistently on this uh, show recently is, is you know, how, you know, digital the digital world uh, really is about tracking even down to the point where like, where, where does your eyeball go when you first open up that phone, right? What's the first ad you see and, and having an ad placed perfectly in that line of vision, uh, even to the store, the grocery stores, right? Having the, the shelf lines, right? Having the specific items versus Diamond. the ones on the low and the high ones. Uh, and it's so interesting how, how quickly um, these things, these things are starting to evolve. Now, uh, you know, Barbara, for you, why location? Why is location, and particularly for small businesses, why is it so valuable? Because it brings them into your door, right? It's it's so important that when you're advertising, do you really know what's coming in from that advertising? You really don't. Whether you're on Facebook, Google, Instagram, 
They're even a walled garden. There is such a bigger web out there that you can advertise on instead of in their little area that they're just making the money, right? So this is why it's so important because when you, when you walk into that fence, I don't care what you close, there's always something open, right? And we have over 150 apps and um, web, and web just the open web to advertise on, right? Because we're, we're in a bidding service. So when that app is opened, they're getting an ad if they're wa walking into that geofence. So they're looking at it. They're, it. It's crazy how much we're on our phone, right? That's prime reality, right? <laughs> So that's how important it is. So when you're driving that kind of volume and you can do clicks and all that stuff, and we have a ton of them, but my main thing is bring them in the door. And if you can bring them in the door, you better be ready to upsell them. Yeah. Know your customer, what they're worth. Because when you're getting that report and I'll say 50 customers, a hundred customers, depending on you know how it comes in that month, you should know how to keep them and upsell them. Yes, yes. In fact, because, no, can you continue, please? No, 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 go ahead. Well, one thing I was saying is like one of the things we've been talking about pretty consistently on the show is the sales funnel, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this product in particular, like what you're talking about, this folks is, is really important to really begin to think about your sales funnel because what, what this team, what Barbara and Ernesto help you do is identify where those individuals are on that level. Right. So, for example, are they engaging uh, in your brand enough to click on your ad on the Facebook page? Right. Or are they just enough that they actually kind of scroll by a little slower? Right. And how, how much of engagement now? Now, Ernesto, you, you guys were kind of talking about reports, right? These reports that you kind of let take me through. I'm a client. We're working with your team. What kind of information should a client expect to receive regarding the, the data that you're, you're able to kind of provide? We're able to, to, uh, to determine if you get a new visit or if you get a repeat visit. So if you're a retail location and this month we sent you 100 visits, our reporting breaks it down where it says uh, 75 new visits, 25, sorry, 75 new visitors, unique visitors, and 25 repeat visits for a grand total of 100. Then it breaks it down to what ad creative they saw, so what size the ad was, what the message of that ad was. Then it goes down to what website or what app they were on. And as Barbara said, we're on, actually on 150,000 different websites and apps. Then we're able to determine which of your competitors or which other location physically, geographically they were at um, when their device was captured. And we're then able to make smarter choices. We're, we're able to, on a weekly basis, go, okay, these locations or, or these websites or these apps are not delivering, they're delivering high number of ad views, but very low number of visitations. So we're, then we're able to go through, remove what's wasteful and put more resources behind what works. You know, what, one thing I love about this, like, especially from a small business perspective, right? You look at, think of the podcast, first, take the podcast, for example, I try to identify one who's listening to the podcast, like one of the things myself, Barbara and Ernesto discussed before this was what are the demographics of the individuals who are listening to this podcast, the age, right, the sex, uh, where are they listening from? Because I wanted to give Barbara and Ernesto kind of a general sense of who our audience is, one. Two, I'm also looking at who am I converting from those listeners to individuals that I could possibly get to my webpage, right? And then when I get them to my webpage, can I get them to become a patron, which is a great time to plug it for $5 a month, folks. You can join our Patreon page to support the podcast. Uh, but again, it's, it's, again, going back to that sales funnel, right? It's, it's trying to get the individuals because, again, we're... As, as small business owners and entrepreneurs, you don't have enough time to really just focus and give every single person the concierge service. You want to, we truly do, but we just don't have that time. So it makes more sense to focus on the folks that are really engaged in your product and your brand and provide them that concierge service. And again, this tool is just going to allow you to help you get to that point. And that point is very important. Location is indicative of uh, some someone's buying potential and so you're only sending ads to people who actually are interested in you so if you own an italian restaurant 
and you want people who really like good cuisine, you would target other Italian restaurants or uh, bakeries or delis um, or even clothing stores where you know that people with really good taste, really refined taste would be interested in what you have. So location is indicative of true buyer's intent and true buyer's interest. Therefore, we're able to only reach people who are only interested in you and what you have to offer. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Okay, now let's 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 do a little uh, let's do a little kind of exercise, Barbara. I'm I'm going to pretend I am a brick and mortar business. Okay. Okay. How do I determine my business strengths and weaknesses with the foot traffic data? Well, that's easy. So with the foot traffic study, we see an hour before and an hour after that they come to your establishment. So we know where they go before and after, and that is indicative of their behavior. So those are our targets, right? Because if that one person comes from there, there's more because that's just behaviors, right? Um, And that's how we determine a huge part of what we do from the standpoint of where we're going to advertise. Of course, there's more to that, but that's the basics. Birds of a feather stick together, right? I'm telling you, it's, it's Maybe, interesting. Maybe, I don't know. If, if you <laughs> yes. build it, they will come. You know, come. If you build it, they will come, but if they don't know about it, nobody's going to come. Yeah, absolutely. How many um, business owners will open up a law firm or open up a doctor's office or open up a satellite office, you know, and they look out at the parking lot, they're like, where the heck is everybody? If you don't really, if you don't literally draw your client a map, you can't expect them to show up. America is, you know, the greatest country on earth with the greatest road infrastructure on earth. So there's a road to everywhere, right? But if you don't draw them a map, then it doesn't matter that you put a shingle on the door. Uh, You really have to lead the right person to your door. And with what happened with, you know, through COVID, we feel very strongly like, you know, we're not, none of us are made of money. Uh, the value of a dollar must go further and further in an inflationary world, in a post-COVID world. And, you know, we're fully capable. We've done TV commercials for the Soup Nazi from Seinfeld, tons of makeup, you know, photo shoots. But we were like, you know what? This may not be glamorous, but it's going to put food on the table Tables. of hardworking Americans. Absolutely. This is why we got, this is like why we do what we do. Not only is that important, make sure you have a marketing budget. It's so important. All these businesses that are starting up that they don't even put that money aside for marketing. And that's part of it. Build it and they come. It's not really how it happens anymore. Yeah, no, I agree. It, it depends on kind of like, a, a, for example, your brand, right? If, if your branding is part of your marketing and having those brand guidelines are important. Um, so people kind of know exactly what you're trying to do. In fact, you know, Ernesto, you mentioned you guys work with a lot of clients and you have a lot of experience. Give me some of what, what are some of uh, prime examples that you've seen, you know, business makers or entrepreneurs consistently make uh, in the past when you're thinking about branding and marketing to their consumers? What are, what are some of the mistakes that you've seen pop up in your experience? I think Barbara's point of not planning on, you know, you, you build a great brand, you, 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 but, you know, maybe a million, two million dollars into, you know, beautifying this restaurant or this boutique. Um, you know, you, you you run sewer lines and all, you know, water, everything you, you put into it. But then, as Barbara said, you didn't plan for advertising. And then when you speak to an, uh, an agency, you're like, you know, you, you skimp on the advertising. And that is a business. I mean, Barbara... Part of our culture at our company is we go out to retail locations. You know, we spend money in businesses in our, wherever we are traveling in our local area, we happen to be on the Jersey shore. And um, there's a lot of restaurants we go have gone to and we're like, um, they didn't plan on any advertising. You know, they bring in chefs from Italy, which was was a recent experience of ours. Yes, that was, that was sad. It was a beautiful, they did a beautiful job on the restaurant. Oh my gosh. It was absolutely gorgeous. It literally, um, you walked in and it was so comfortable. They were singing in the back, cooking. They didn't make it because they didn't put any, they put everything into the business and nothing into the marketing. Not, you know, and for marketing, that's that's huge. And also, 
you should do a foot traffic study in the beginning when, because that's how you're going to know. That's how you're going to know how many people that you should be getting. That would help you with your marketing because now you know how many people you have to hit that, you know, you have to put that money towards that for marketing. Otherwise, you're not going to even hit the people that are around you. Just because they're in the parking lot doesn't mean they're walking into your store. Just- and you're in the Pacific Northwest. Correct. So the geography in the country in the Pacific Northwest is very different than what it is on the on most of the East Coast. So, for example, you have gi- giant differences in elevation. You have bodies, beautiful bodies of water that innervate, you know, the land. So you often do need to drive a map you know, draw a map for your clients and or your customers and doing, so say you want to open up a new location, right? And uh, the geographical challenges that you would have in the Pacific Northwest. If you want to open up a location, you can look at, and you, and it's virgin earth, you know, un, un, untapped retail space. You can look at the gas station across the street. You can look at the gas station a mile down the road and get a snapshot of what that business is doing that's been around for a while and then you can make an educated uh, decision like, hey, if they're drawing business and I'm a quarter mile, half a mile, mile down the road, same side of the road or across the street, you, you can make certain uh, inferences. Yeah. And and judgments based on on raw, on the good data. So, um, you know, a lot of businesses don't plan for the most important part. Even Jesus had 12 disciples. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it, it was enough that God gave us a miracle, but um, he, you know, he had 12 messengers and uh, without those messengers, you know, it's, it's not quite as robust. So um, you need messengers out there. A good agency is important. Um, you know, good branding, as you were talking about before. And geofencing, we believe, is a, a giant future of how to help small businesses and large and small, but really small business owners need something like this. It's an advantage over, as Barbara was saying, competing in those walled oh, gardens God. where Facebook owns the territory. You don't own that relationship. Google owns the territory and owns that relationship. Amazon owns it. But in geofencing, you can bring them to your door. And then it's up to you to give them that customer experience. It's up to you to get their contact information so you can keep that relationship. Information is very important. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. And keep that relationship <laughs> going. No, no, exactly. I, I agree. And I think information is, is very important, to, as Barbara's pointing out. In fact, you know, Barbara, you guys were kind of mentioning how you guys grew this business and in in getting out and meeting with your customers. Uh, geo, you know, geofencing is one thing, but how important has networking been as well for your team? Sorry. <laughs> doing cameras too. Um, it, you know, um, we did old school, Ernesto and I. We literally went out in the beginning and started knocking on doors. Believe it or not, we did. We went down uh, the Jersey Shore because we're on the Jersey Shore. He's a little north of me. And we actually went south and we went into businesses and t- tried to explain to them what we did. And we got... Um, we actually got customers. <laughs> it was great, you know. With made, national so, reach. Yeah, with national reach. And it was, you know, we still, you know, do all the technical stuff for ourselves. But I still love the one-on-one, the going in, the, it, the feel of that. It's a human touch to it of marketing. Even some flyers we did and we just dropped them off. And then one day we got a call from it. We still talk to them, but the one that was great was um, we walked in. We kind of, it was funny because he kind of said, "Ah, I don't know about this," and he was talking to Ernesto, and then I ended up talking to him, and we he was like, "All right, maybe maybe this might be good for my business," because he had a couple locations around New Jersey, and um, we convinced him to try us, and then he actually did, and he was like, "Oh my God!" Each one of his locations. It just, the business started exploding and he was like, wow, this really works. So now, so he was like, well, what can we do for this national thing? So, yeah. So it all starts at the bottom. You know, you grow that, you grow that base, but if you grow it smartly and strong, you can compound that and it stays. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the, 
the base is usually the one that holds the most weight, right? And that takes kind of the longest. And then once you kind of get the foundation, everything's a little bit easier after that. Now, Ernesto, starting with you, what's one thing that you would say that you're really glad you kind of learned throughout this process that you went through because it helped you become a better successful entrepreneur? I think, um, I don't, I'm not, you know, I know it's a week from Valentine's, but Barbara, <laughs> my business partner, <laughs> I would say is the most uh, critical because um, not all th there's no way that a company our size that one per in with our reach can there's no way I could do it by myself to have and and I understand you know people warn me hey before you go into business with anyone you know before you accept money or or from from you know an investment bank before you do you know pause because you're generally not going to be happy you know, with a partner, or if you partner with an investment bank or, or a group. And, um, but I, I do have to say the, the biggest contribution to our success is finding a partner like Barbara, who um, works with integrity, loves the clients as much as I do, who, um, maybe a little more. <laughs> she's definitely a lot. <laughs> well, Barbara's definitely the nicer of the two. Like, you know, we grew up on the Jersey Shore. So I'm more like, I think of like a mafia mentality. If I don't like someone, I'm like, let's, you know, let's beat them up. Let's have them roughed up. Hey. You know? Barbara's like, we'll get more with, um, you know, sugar than with vinegar or whatever. So, you know, but someone with integrity really helps. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of small business owners can relate to the, to the same exact thing. If I want to grow, What's the wisest way to do it? I know what my weaknesses were, and we happened to have been friends, and I knew what her character was, and I knew what her strengths oh were. Oh, boy, he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think that's, that, that's our, other than having, you know, a brilliant algorithm and, and technologies, it's really picking the right people to work with. And, and I'm very blessed Barbara was the right partner for, for us, for our company, and for me. And we built it with using family members. We and are truly a family company. company. It is. It is truly. <laughs> it's Kaleri and Wardell. Okay. And yeah. her and son is a chief technologist of our company, and you know my brother is one of the other technologists, master programmer, and my other brother is a junior programmer, and her other son's a master programmer and technologist. We just have technology all over. Oh man, I'm just Jesus. outnumbered that I'm the only female. So yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I heard a lot of brothers and sons and nephews. And, <laughs> my goodness. But that's all right. I, I stand my own. We're good. I love it. I love it. And, and you know, Barbara, same question to you. What's something that you've gone through throughout this process that you felt, or you're glad that you've gone through this because it has helped you become a more successful entrepreneur? I think um, patience as well with new technology, sometimes you're working with it and it's not working the way it should work. Cause we had that in the beginning. Um, because when you're relying on technology, there's things that are out of your control that you can't fix because you're not getting that data that you're supposed to fix. And in the beginning we had a little bumps. We went with, um, with our platform and it's frustrating cause you know, it's supposed to work. And it's not doing what it should. And the thing that I can tell you the most that I think I learned the most is always be ready to learn more, to look at technology and don't be afraid of the technology. It's so important because we're not going backwards, though I do still want to have that human touch. I do love hugs, but you got to embrace it, but balance it. So that way we can go forward and use it to our advantage, but not overuse it where we're missing that personal touch. I would yeah. say that. Yeah, no, and I'm, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, having that still that human interaction with folks is, is very going to be very important. Uh, in fact, speaking of human interactions for the <laughs> folks listening, how can they contact you? If they are interested in learning more about your guys' team, maybe want to become clients of yours, how do they find out more about your team? They can visit us at calarimedia.com. That's C as in Charlie, U-L-L-A-R-I, media.com. They can see all the various verticals we've worked with and all the brands, big and small, we've worked with. And uh, we have plenty of explainer videos on there to uh, detail the science and the technology and the techniques. And um, yeah, so we're, we're here for you. Yeah, and we, we'd love to talk to you. And uh, just explain what we do. And if we can help, we're always here. 
Perfect. And again, folks, if uh, you forget any of that information, this is a great time to shamelessly plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship <laughs> newsletter, which you can subscribe to at theshadesofe.com. We'll have all of the information uh, for their team. Uh, again, their contact information, their websites. Uh, we'll also have them on our social. So please feel free to follow our social media accounts as well. Uh, before we go, is there any last words you would like to uh, let the listeners know? I would say um, that, you know, we we feel your pain after COVID. Um, we understand inflationary pressures and, you know, to take out a loan nowadays, uh, the debt, you know, the interest rates are really high. And we understand that. And we believe wholeheartedly, which is why we focus on geofencing, that geofencing will give you a great return on your investment. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to spend, you don't have to break the bank to do it. You do it on modest, very modest ad budgets but your return on investment will be very high. Our average cost per visit is $5 a visit all across the country. And it's crazy. It's awesome. Sorry. Wow. No, that's voice. great. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if that $5 turns into, uh -huh. you know, acquisitions and, and transactions. I mean, that's then, that's the goal. I mean, it's amazing. Barbara, was there anything you'd like to say before we leave? I think, um, I think overall, I think that if you do marketing, really look into the marketing um, company that you are going to use and get some knowledge before you have that conversation so that you have an intelligent conversation with them. I think it's important because some people just come in and say, okay, you know, just do it. But then when they get the reports, they don't know how to read them. I mean, and we take the time. We always show them how, but um, I just think that's important that you put that effort into your marketing so you understand it. So when you get those results, you know where it's coming from. That's very important that you're not spending in every direction and not knowing where it's coming from. Man, that's so true. And thank you again. I feel like this whole conversation is really useful for those listening because again, it's, it's really starting to kind of start to drill down on who your true target audience is and target market is. Uh, I think a lot of the times as entrepreneurs, we tend to run our heads against the wall because uh, we do the shotgun strategy approach, right? We visit every single person and see what made the biggest impact uh, and that burns everybody out, right? And and so yes. this is just a great way to kind of uh, streamline your outreach, so to speak, uh, be a little bit more strategic in that sense. Uh, again, it, it's this is really gonna help you narrow down your focus and help you build your target audience. And again, focus on that sales funnel, right? How to get from the awareness to a loyal consumer. Barbara, Ernesto, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate you, it. Man. I think this is a really good conversation. I'm very interested in the geofencing myself. I, I, I'm going to have to dig into it a little bit more. Um, it, again, I'm I'm more of a the podcaster right now, not not selling a product, but I think once we get into that product realm, I think it's I think it's going to be very uh, important to kind of uh, get in there. Again, folks, col um, uh, how do you pronounce your business again? Calari and Calari Wardell. Media. Calari. Calari Media with a C. C U L L A R I Media. Dot com. Perfect. Yeah, it's Calarium Wardell. <laughs> and again, this information will be on the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. So please subscribe. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.